Well, what do you say we get rolling? Literally. Sit in the webinar. Okay. Let's get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded for people who are unable to attend today, and it will be available on the Parallax YouTube channel. I welcome you today. We have had over 200 registrations for this webinar. So there's definitely interest in the micro bit used on robots. Um, with us today is Nicer, who is a contributor and collaborator on this project. I'll introduce them in just a moment. And I will answer the one question quickly about when this is available. Um, if you work in Parallax, it's available today, but in March, you will be able to order these. So a little bit of housekeeping um, before we get going. If Zoom is new to you, um, it can be a little bit confusing to use, but you have ability to interact with us. And that's why we're doing this as a webinar, because we want to hear from you. So there's a Q&A, and you can type in questions there. And if I don't see them, Stephanie will definitely bring them up. And you can also raise your hand and talk. Um, and we will enable your microphone. So because there's so many of us, Stephanie will have to look carefully for that. And if we can't answer your question right away, um, we'll just move it on and then get it later. We welcome your participation. Any, any comments here you want to provide are appreciated. First, we'll introduce the hosts, or they will introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Ken Gracie. I'm the CEO of Parallax. I've been making educational robots with my team for over 20 years. And this is my hobby and my profession. Mm -hmm. I'm Chuck Gardner. I'm the director of curriculum for NYSERC. I'm a former classroom teacher and a, a Merchant Marine Academy veteran uh, who made a career transformation uh, to, to get into the classroom. And I've been working with Parallax products for the last four or five, six years uh, in the classroom. And now we support them with uh, some content. And I'm Tommy Gober. Uh, I'm a longtime Parallax customer, a big fan, and uh, joined NYSERC um, after leaving the classroom. and. Uh, where I taught computer science and all the technology courses. Uh, I've always had a love for uh, the robotics platform that I think many of you guys do too. That's why you're here. Um, and uh, at NYSERC, we develop curriculum uh, to support classroom teachers using uh, many of the Parallax products. And quick question was asked, what is NYSERC? And this is so important because um, we run into people that don't know NYSERC and you run into people that don't know us. Who's NYSERC? Um, let me cover two questions right there. Uh, so NYSERC is the National Integrated Cyber Education Research Center, and we're the academic division for the Cyber Innovation Center, which is headquartered out of Bossier City, Louisiana. Uh, NYSERC is funded through a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Multi-pronged approach, the baseline is we write and distribute curriculum for K-12 teachers across the country for free at no cost. Uh, cyber.org uh, is uh, the Cyber Innovation Center's website. NYSERC is at NYSERC.org, N-I-C-E-R-C, NYSERC.org. Thanks so much, Chuck. And also our guests, all 90 of you that are hanging out, thanks for being here today. Um, this is your time, <laughs> even though we're talking at you. So um, again, welcome your feedback here. Our agenda today, uh, we have a little less than an hour. Sometimes we go over because of questions, and that's absolutely welcome. We're going to do introductions. That's done. We're going to talk about the goals of this particular robot. And then the micro bit and Python. So the micro bit and Python are two big stars of the show. And how it works, how the software is loaded into it. Where's the curriculum? What's the curriculum? And then we're going to have some demonstrations, the good kind with robots. And we'll talk about price and availability and just take questions. So we're speaking to educators of all levels here. I realize we have elementary all the way through university. I think there's something in here for everybody. We're going to try to kind of keep it um, understandable. At times, we'll dig a little deeper in technical details for those who really want to know. But ultimately, this robot is very simple to use. And one question that's come up, which we'll steer right away, is, um, oh, gosh, do I have to switch robots? And the answer there is no, 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 no. Um, each of our robots shines in their own way. And teachers who use different robots love them for the reasons they use them for. Um, in terms of migrating to this or moving to it, the easiest transition you could make would be from um, the shield bot, where you're basically just swapping out the control board on top, and the bobot. And you're adding a battery pack to make the bobot work. But very briefly, the strengths of all these robots 
are that the Bobot is programmed in basic, it's very simple, direct um, language that has good hardware control. The Shield Bot, we obviously all know that because the Arduino program in C, that's used in schools that just want to have the Arduino. We want to be sure to give them the Arduino robot. And then the Cyberbot, and its big strength is MicroPython or Python. So if you're a school that wants to focus on Python programming, it's a great way to get there. And our most popular robot is actually the ActivityBot 360 because its features are, are so unique and so different, it can't easily be converted into um, a Cyberbot. Normally when Parallax makes a robot, uh, we control the whole ecosystem. We control the software, the hardware, the manufacturing, the curriculum, um, all those pieces. And this project is very unique. And as you'll notice, these are some of the players, the participants. So while you do have to gather up the pieces to make it work, it's actually going to be pretty easy because they'll be directly available on our website. But to give you an idea of what we're all doing, Parallax, we're obviously managing this and then um, manufacturing them in Rockland, California. So you already know what we do. Many of you have been to our office before. Microbit um, Foundation makes the Microbit and distributes them through Farnell and Newark. So that's where we get the processor. NYSERC is doing the curriculum and tutorials, which will be on Learn. And MicroPython, um, which is a hardware-based version of Python, was created externally as well by Damien George, and that runs on the micro bit. And then we get our code editor from yet another place, Code with Mu. So there are lots of pieces here that we've um, connected together to make this work cleanly. Some of our goals for this, um, really, I think the most important goal is for teachers is that they're running the class the students remember. Okay, and that's easy to do when you're using robots and you're programming. And I, I know how it feels to be a teacher that has a deflated class because I also have my um, CTE credential and some days go great, some don't, but you want to be the class that remember that's hopefully the ability we'll give you. We want this to be very turnkey um, and give you also the ability to move students on that need more advanced projects. Um, so if you have micro bits, this can keep them going for another project, a robot. And for students, we want, obviously want to inspire them. We want them to build their own robot. So two students or one student per robot, help them learn Python and build electronic circuits. We minimize the use of black boxes of parallax and we do work with components. And hopefully the students will love this so much they'll stay in the breaks, during breaks. And for Parallax and NYSERC, um, the goal is this is very sustainable, like our other products. So if you invest in it as a teacher, you will have our support for the long term. Tommy, I'll pass this over to you. Talk about the micro bit. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think most folks in here are familiar with the micro bit. If you're not, uh, well, here you have it on the screen here. Um, on the on the left side there, you've got um, just kind of the, the front face of it where you've got different sensors that are built into it. And um, a couple of push buttons are soldered in place. There's nothing to wire up. And then you've got some uh, contact points down at the bottom. Zero, one, and two, those pins you see that are kind of gold color there. Um, those are kind of GPIO pins. They allow general purpose input output pins. Um, you can just use like some alligator clips. Uh, I think I have one floating around here somewhere. Um, you can just clip onto the bottom. Uh, just one of these will clip onto the bottom of a micro bit like so. And you'll see a lot of uh, tutorials will, will say to use that. But that gets kind of clunky and, and difficult to do whenever you start getting more complex builds. And it also doesn't do anything to talk about uh, to, or to interface with those little tiny pins that are in between. If you see on the graphic there, you've got those real wide zero, one, two, a three volt power rail and a ground. But in between each of those, you've got little uh, uh, connection points there. So um, it's really hard to, to get those uh, connected in a lot of different ways. If you take your, the micro bit and you flip it on the back side, um, you can kind of see that it's uh, there on that graphic on the side. Uh, it's got a, um, oh, it's a uh, NRF, uh, what kind of, remember my notes here, 51. It's a little embedded processor. It has um, a lot of different features that are built into it, but um, it also has uh, a, a compass on here, an accelerometer. Um, there's a temperature sensor inside that processor 
which, by the way, whenever you're playing with these things, remember that that temperature sensor is inside that processor. So you're not really getting kind of the atmospheric temperature around here. You're actually getting the core temperature of that processor. So you're going to have a little bit of uh, lag in how responsive the temperature is. And, um, you know, you'll lose some uh, uh, sensitivity that way. But the really kind of really cool thing that the microbit has built into it is Bluetooth capability. Um, there's a, a Bluetooth uh, radio wired into this, so allowing microbits to talk back and forth. It does eat up quite a bit of code, so um, we're having some challenges uh, with that, but lots of fun stuff you can do with microbits. If you haven't already pl started playing with them, check them out. They're low cost, and um, you know, they're about, I think they retail for, um, you know, they're less than 20 bucks. The other cool thing is on the front there, you've got a, uh, an LED display. You can program it to have different graphics. Here's a little heart, or you have a smiley face. Um, super, super easy to program these, and uh, you know, get a winner right out of the box. Uh, I think those and are languages, all languages, Tommy. How many languages are useful on the microbit? Oh man, there, so you can program uh, Python is, is the language of choice that we're uh, that we've been playing with. You can also do uh, JavaScript. There are several uh, different iterations of graphical programming. Um, I think uh, Carol had mentioned over in the Q and A uh, that she's been using Make Code. It's a project that uh, comes out of Microsoft. They're one of the original partners helping. Um, the BBC when they were coming up with this. So there's a, a range of, of languages you can do with it. Right now we're focusing on Python because it's a text-based language, but um, I don't think it's too far off to uh, get into some of that graphical block-based programming for programming beginners. Programming beginners is a good segue here in this slide. Um, someone has butchered these four milk jugs. I don't know what on earth <laughs> has happened. Um, no, this is a, a really cool thing. You see this time and again, uh, folks that are playing with the micro bit. Um, circuit boards are scary to some folks. It's the, they're, you know, am I gonna get shocked? Is, is this, what, what are all these little parts and pieces that I have to connect? I don't do electronics that well. The micro bit is great. Um, we have, uh, whenever we're doing workshops with teachers uh, on these, they say, how strong or how resilient are these boards? Um, and uh, I think it was uh, Joe McAdam, one of our curriculum developers, uh, when asked that, he just took it and pitched it across the room and said, they're that strong. They, they're not going, they're, they're built to be kid proof. Um, and to that end, so some folks are saying, well, let's get this in the hands of kids. And um, what a lot of folks are doing is building these kind of little monsters that you see here out of milk jugs. And it's just a real kind of artistic, fun, interactive way to start playing with the micro bit. Um, there's a whole lot more that the micro bit is capable of more than just being taped or glued to a, a milk jug uh, and, and dressed up in this way. But this is a great introduction showing that you can be artistic and creative with the micro bit when you're just learning, uh, getting started with it. And then there's more to follow after that. Uh, if any of you guys have been playing with the micro bit on your own up to this point, you've probably done quite a bit with the micro bit itself, but you're like, there's so much more I can do because remember it only has those three contact points and I can only fit so many of these alligator clips in, in place on here. So how do I get to those other ones? Well, to that end, we've got, um, there are sockets, uh, different vendors make these different sockets that what you can do is you can plug this, the micro bit into one of these sockets. And, and that's the solution uh, that a lot of folks are offering on that, but there's a drawback. And that's one of the challenges that we had early on you only get so many insertions and removals on these sockets before that socket gets really loose. Um, any gamer from the 80s and 90s will remember the old Nintendo Entertainment System. You had to blow into the cartridge to, and you had to wiggle the game cartridge around to get it to make a good connection or your game wouldn't load. That's the same kind of technology that's on this socket here. Uh, with the kids plugging in micro bits and unplugging and plugging them in, you're gonna start to have points of failure. And if you're trying to get kids excited about coding and interacting with stuff. You know, you started with the milk jug, monsters that are there, um, trying to make it more artistic and creative and, and approachable to students that may not otherwise be interested in programming. Um, having points of failure is a, is a real uh, downer with that. So uh, to that end, that socket is a real, is a real challenge. And the solution uh, that uh, Parallax and, and NYSERC came up with is this, uh, this is the backside of the, the board itself. And there's some little pins that are on the bottom here. We've got a, a slide later on that you can get a better picture of it. 
But right here along the bottom, there are some uh, contact pins and the micro bit touches those. And so you're not inserting, removing, inserting, removing, and weakening those, those connection points. You're, um, you're making a good solid connection and you've got access to all of those uh, IO pins that are on there. So uh, really powerful stuff with that. So up comes to the question, uh, I, I just mentioned that we're doing parallax, uh, or I'm sorry, that we're doing Python. Um, why Python? Why are we doing that? Why aren't we starting with the block-based and so on and so forth? Well, first of all, it's really easy to cook up uh, all the supporting uh, code in Python. And Python is also taking over CS education. Um, a lot of computer science uh, teachers are moving towards Python as an introductory uh, programming language. Um, actually, back up one more slide real quick there. Um, Wanted to show that uh, over here on the, the right side there, you've got the that kind of purplish uh, book there. That's the guide from the uh, AP uh, Computer Science Principles course. College Board uh, does not recommend or does not specify what language to use on there. And so they're leaving that choice open to classroom teachers. Uh, a lot of folks are, are moving towards using Python. On the left there, we've got a couple of snippets where uh, the growth in Python is really showing in colleges and universities over 50% of colleges and universities now are using Python, and that number is growing because that statistic is old. Um, so it's, it's just growing and growing and growing. Uh, for a long time, we've been focused on Java, and some of you guys may have remembered the Javelin uh, uh, project that Parallax had. Um, a lot of inter interest in that, but Java can be difficult to, to work with at first as a first out of the gate programming language. That's where Python comes in. Um, to that end, uh, Python does have some, uh, some strengths there, and we've got a bulleted list coming up here that you can look at. Some of the stuff that I like about it is uh, it's beginner friendly. It's a great intro way to do that. Um, and we put on here that it reads like English. It, it kind of has a basic like feel to it, but it's still object oriented. You can do quite a bit with it. You can focus on, um, on teaching object oriented programming in there. Or you can just stick with, uh, you know, without doing an object and just kind of leave all that abstract from the, the end user. It does run on embedded hardware, which is how we came to use it on this project um, out of a, a Python project called MicroPython. More on that a little bit. And then there's uh, programming tool supports uh, that are out there. They're all open source. Uh, they work across different um, operating systems and um, so that you're not being bound to any one particular platform that's that's just something that comes about um, as a real strength whenever you're uh, looking at languages is what platform am I going to teach this on? And we know that schools all across the country, some are using Mac, some are using PC only, some are using Chromebooks, you name it, they're all over the place. Uh, one of the things that I liked whenever I was uh, teaching in the classroom with, uh, with Python is it forces these new programmers to align all of their code. If you're not familiar with Python, it's white space uh, oriented, which means that all code that's indented has to be in line and all that, that code runs at the same level. Um, so indentation matters. You're not put, going around putting curly braces here and there and, and on. Um, the, the indentation really helps uh, structure the code. It teaches good programming habits to make legible, readable code for others. Um, and then the this next bullet point here is that it, we said that it's not overly verbose. Um, you, you don't have these really long, uh, seemingly difficult syntax uh, statements for students. I'm gonna pick on Java a little bit. Java does get a little bit verbose, and especially if you've done anything with like the GUIs and stuff like that. But um, it, um, the, it's, it's easy to get at what you're trying to teach and just focus on uh, individual topics that you're there instead of just saying, well, you just have to type this and just trust me with it. And of course, the other thing that we like about it is it's free and open source as all good languages are. Um, you don't have to deal with giving credit to any kind of corporation or anything like that. And Tommy will have some code examples up too. So people yeah, who've yeah. never seen it will get a look at it in a minute. Let's see that. So what's this MicroPython? Okay, so we've talked about Python. What's MicroPython? MicroPython is created by this gentleman on the lower right, Damien George, as part of a Kickstarter project a couple years ago. Um, so MicroPython is considered an embedded language for physical computing, or we call microcontrollers. Um, up until recently, most a lot of the microcontroller work has been compiled. But um, this Python is an interpreter um, that runs in the micro bit, just like the basic stamp has an interpreter. So the microcontrollers that use it have enough power to run the interpreter. 
Um, it's, it's a lean, efficient language as part of Python 3, and the library is a subset of the standard Python library. It's optimized to run on microcontrollers in memory-constrained environments. So this isn't to say that um, MicroPython is somehow you know, less than Python. It's, it is to say that what is there is suited for the hardware it's controlling. So it's a perfect fit for the micro bit and for processors that run it. Um, when I started programming in it, which first time was just a few months ago, I found it to be like the joys of PBASIC to me, basic, but with the power of an object-oriented language. So it was really, it's very clean and fun to write in and understandable. In fact, we're looking at using uh, MicroPython on the propeller too. So Parallax will usually refer to MicroPython and Python just as Python for now. Can we have a question from Amber on this who hasn't used MicroPython before and is curious how the number of its libraries compares to the Arduino uh, body out there? And maybe Tommy and Chuck have had more longer experience with it might answer that. Uh, yeah, I can uh, knock that out really quick. There, there are a lot of libraries available for, uh, for Python, but uh, one constraint you have with the micro bit is that it doesn't have a lot of memory to, uh, to share with a lot of those libraries. A lot of those libraries are not written um, with the memory constraints in mind that something like the microbit has. So there are plenty of libraries available. It comes down to a question of, does, can, you, can you cram all of that into the memory constraints on the microbit? So yeah, on that note, um, <laughs> at the beginning of all the parallax code, you'll see that we've imported a code module or what I call a library. And it's called Parallax, and we get to refer to it as bot, which starts an instance of the object. Um, so let's just talk for a minute about the, the code. You're looking at the new editor, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and you can download this at codewith.mu. So on its own, the microbit can't do everything we need it to do. And that's why we have this, this library or module to support it. And the module provides very direct control over the motors, sensors, you know, laser sensors, ultrasonic, um, infrared communications, basically all the circuits that you've seen on Parallax robots. So we can now access them once this library is brought into the micro bit. And um, in this example, we're just driving the motors. So bot 22 is an instance of the bot object, which is from the Parallax module. And you can import other libraries. So the Parallax module actually includes the micro bit one, but you, you can import the NeoPixel or whatever pretty much till you run out of memory. So how do we get this in here? Here's a little video of that. Um, so you'll download from our website when this is going the parallax.py module and you'll put it in your code, new code directory. And once it's there, you open up um, the new editor it shows up and you can drag it onto the micro bit. And if you click on files and still there, now you have it. So now you can actually code with it. So you could go about writing your code, putting in a comment. And um, I'm importing the module now and star brings it all in. Or you could just import bot, but it just so happens right now that the whole module is bot or star, it's the same thing. And then get on with writing your code. This is the complete listing of the Parallax uh, library module methods. So these, these allow us to pack a whole lot of functionality into a single code statement. Each of these method calls results in communication between the micro bit and the propeller. The propeller will carry out the command and then respond with the results. Um, for example, the single line here, IR detect, um, when used, generates the infrared at 38 kilohertz splashes that light out on the LED, checks the receiver, and then returns a lower high in one line of code. And similarly, the TV remote method, that decodes the entire set of pulses from a Sony remote like this, and then returns a number. So it's quite, quite easy, easy to use in this way. And we'll get a closer look at this in just a few minutes. So how about the hardware? Um, you've seen how we've copied the parallax.py module onto the micro bit, um, but how do we make it so capable? This is how we did it. So the parallax.py library, or 
uh, module, it's actually an I2C interface to the propeller microcontroller. So the propeller is handling all the I.O. control with a few exceptions. So when you start an instance of the bot object, you're actually sending commands to and from the propeller. And this is transparent to the programmers. So to them, they're, they're programming um, for interfacing the circuitry on the breadboard. So the hardware that you're looking at here, this is a block diagram of really the whole system, um, does several things. So physically, the Cyberbot board gives us a connection to the micro bit um, through the screen contacts that Tommy was showing. And then it connects the micro bit to the propeller so the propeller can be used for the IO control. And then it manages all the power and ground distributions, which you'll see up on top where you can plug in the motors. It also provides direct access to the micro bit IOs without the propeller in the way. Um, in particular, the round ring um, IOs on the micro bit are easy to get to. And then the A to D is brought out to the breadboard. And there is also a low battery indicator LED on the Cyberbot board. This is a, a big boost. Um, it's such a simple thing, but half of our calls of Parallax that are tech oriented um, usually relate to power supply if there's a robot involved. Power supply, can't find the COM port. Yeah, you know. This is a top view of the Cyberbot. So you'll see the um, micro bit modules um, plugged into the back, actually screwed in so the contacts make a connection. And then your power supply, power jack is also there. And as you move to the right, you'll see that your servos are plugged into those headers. And then there's the familiar breadboard for building circuits. And then on the bottom is the ground connections, and then the A to D and D to A, and also the power switch, um, which is off, on without motor power, or everything powered, including motors. Um, what's really wonderful here and allows us to do a lot with this robot is something so simple. It's the chassis design. So this chassis has been around, as you know, for 20 years. And when you're introducing an educational robot and you, you need it to have longevity, you really need to, or we need to, leverage everything we've done before. So in particular, add-ons like the ping mounting bracket, which is the rotating ultrasonic sensor, or the line follower, or the gripper, those accessories can be used with this robot. So we've kept this chassis the same, so nothing is obsoleted. And as you go underneath, you'll see the motors. These are our standard continuous rotation servos. Um, same thing used on the shield bot and the bow bot. And the battery pack is different. Um, this is a five cell battery pack. The shield bot uses five cells with the Arduino and um, the bow bot has a four cell pack. So you'd replace that. Um, should also point out that this robot supports the use of alkaline and nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries. See the questions are, are coming up. That's great. Thanks, Andy, for answering those. So I'm going to pass over to Chuck, and he's going to tell you about the resources for this. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there currently existing to support the micro bit. Uh, we would just want to point you in the direction of a couple um, that that we've been using throughout the development. Um, you know, you want to start learning more about how to use the micro bit so you can be ready for the cyber bot when it hits the hits the ground. Um, on the left, you'll notice the microbit.org website. A lot of great tutorials in there if you've got some micro bits. Um, this will help step you through uh, learning how to use it. Uh, there's a great emulator that comes with that site uh, that that you can help uh, help to guide the development process uh, of the learning, but. Also for the students, um, you, what you see here is not really classroom content like we're used to seeing it. It's not the lesson plans and, and you know, curriculum that Microbit's putting out there, but uh, kind of solve your own adventure games for students to work through. So you can pull up some uh, tutorial libraries and some resources from the Microbit site, assign some for students to work through, and they can learn uh, at their own pace. And that's using the, um, the micro Python. And uh, there's also some, some block examples there if you're coding with just the micro bit. Uh, on the right is, is where Tommy provided a link earlier in the chat for um, the coding with Mu um, software. And this is um, what we're using to develop the um, tutorials and the, the content for the, um, 
for the learn.parallax uh, forum where we're gonna uh, support the, the introductory material for the microbit and cyberbot development. Uh, so this is where you'll get the editor and, uh, and be able to practice some of the code. And you can use both the MicroPython from MicroBit or the Code with Mute editor uh, to support the programs that are on either the MicroBit or the CyberBot. Um, what we see here is, is just what NYSERC currently has to support microbit development. Uh, as Tommy indicated before, uh, our first focus for microbit and cyberbot is going to be text-based, so we're using Python. Um, NYSERC already has uh, content developed to support microbit in the classroom. Uh, you can see there's 13 lessons on the left that we have uh, provided through our Canvas site. If you're a K-12 teacher, uh, in the US and you don't have access to our content, please let us know. Uh, there's a, a link on the slide here. Parallax is actively supporting um, links to nicer content. Uh, register for access and, and we'll, uh, we'll give you access to these lessons. Uh, what we envision for the Cyberbot is once the introductory material has been developed through the learn.parallax forum, uh, we're gonna also develop um, classroom content to support the Cyberbot in the classroom. Uh, with full year uh, courses, modular examples, uh, and everything else that you'll need to, to roll out, <laughs> pardon the pun, Cyberbot in the classroom. <laughs> so we want to talk about how Cyberbot is going to make connections to real world. Uh, NYSERC content is all about creating the next generation of cyber citizenry and making students aware of uh, cyber jobs, cybersecurity jobs that are available. Uh, so we want to make sure there's connections uh, to all of the content that we write to make uh, students more aware. And, and to start, we want to talk about cybersecurity and, and what these tools like the Cyberbot, the Bobot, the Arduino Shieldbot, uh, give students the ability to do is understand how stuff works. They can take things apart, they can create new circuits, and then they code those circuits to interact with uh, the real world, virtual world um, environment. So knowing how things work helps them understand how things don't work. And if they get something wrong, it's their job to come back and troubleshoot and fix. They can't always raise their hand in the real world to get help. So the content that we're writing to support these awesome platforms are helping generate a more aware and a more capable um, K-12 student that then is gonna provide a more aware environment for uh, two year, four year, or jumping right into career with um, cybersecurity degrees or credentials. Um, so they know how to take things apart, they know how to put them together, troubleshoot, and then we bring in cybersecurity and hardening systems. We've got an example here on this page of our bank vault bobot. Oh, sorry, Ken. Yep. Uh, of our, if we can just slide back real quick. Uh, uh, our bank vault bobot project. Uh, so what we're teaching here is, is we're showing them the, the bot on top first. It's a four digit push button and they set a code and they try and break into the code. We talk about brute force and how long it would take a human to try all the combinations. Of course, with four buttons, it's really simple. Um, but then we talk about expanding it to 10 and then alphanumeric and so on and so on and expanding it to eight digits and 12 digits. And then we can come in and take another bot that writes an algorithm that tests all the possible combinations and it does it in a fraction of a time. So there's where we take students through all of those four bullets um, to, to help them uh, develop this real world appreciation for what's happening in, in the cyber world. And the cyberbot curriculum, uh, once the, the bot hits the ground, you'll see support on Parallax's Learned at Parallax um, site, their repository for educational tutorials and, and um, resources. Uh, we'll also have, as the summer approaches, some content. Like I said, the cyber literacy will be ported to the cyberbot. We'll have some uh, middle school content once we begin working on the, the um, graphical programming support, the block-based programming. Uh, we intend to, to have content available for, uh, for middle school and, and possibly younger. We want this to be a, a platform that can grow with the student all the way through um, to their uh, either senior year in high school or beyond, uh, depending on the uh, application within uh, higher ed. Uh, but, um, keep, uh, keep an eye on learn.parallax.com slash cyberbot. Uh, there's already some uh, information there. Again, no, no links yet because the content's being written, but uh, bookmark that and then uh, make sure you register with nicer.org. Uh, and once our cyberbot curriculum becomes available, we'd love to share that with, with everyone in our network as well. Uh, so there are some of the great research that we've got coming up for cyberbot.
Um, should point out too, just to uh, reinforce something you said. So right now, any American educator can go to NYSERC and um, register their name and then gain access to your content management system, which has student handouts, teacher worksheets, and code in a nice format for the micro bit. Yep, uh, our content, our, our website is a one-stop shop to help support teachers in the classroom. Uh, like Ken said, everything from student materials, teacher materials, uh, rubrics, grading guides, tests, study guides, uh, PowerPoint presentations, uh, and we intend the CyberBot to have all of that uh, and more. So please register at nicerg.org slash curricula access. Yeah, perfect. And I think Wayne Green had a question. We can let him ask it while we get demos ready. Um, uh, so Wayne's question is, is this available for after school programs, non-traditional teachers? <laughs> I don't know if he was gonna, uh, if we were gonna uh, un unmute, but yes. Uh, so um, we we look at every request for access to nicerc.org content, uh, and we'd love to hear from uh, from anyone who wants to use this content. Um, basically, it's it's free for all educators in the country, uh, as and as I say, plus anyone who has direct impact with the K twelve population. So that includes summer camps, after school programs, homeschools. Um, church groups. So please request access and we'd love to engage with you uh, more. Great. Okay, so we're going to switch over to some videos here. Actually, Ken, some live demos. Ken, before we do yeah. that, we do have a question from Rob Faludi about um, the curriculum over here in the Q&A pane. Oh, hey, Rob. Uh, on REPL, um, so uh, right out of the gate, no, we're not going to be uh, doing anything with REPL just because there's already other stuff that's out there. But yeah, I do agree that it's a great way to to start kind of dabbling with that. Um, maybe uh, maybe Chuck and I will get together on that. We might, you know, as as kind of an on ramp as you're learning Python to get into REPL. Um, for those of you who don't know, REPL is like an interactive. Um, I don't recall what it, it stands for. Somebody might help me out in the chat window on that. But <laughs> it's the uh, interactive command prompt for that. Yeah, so yeah. maybe we'll, maybe we'll add that in there. I do want to, while Ken's uh, getting ready there, I do want you guys to pay attention to the code that's there on the screen. Look how nice and neat and orderly. Also, before we leave Rob Faludi behind, um, Rob, okay. please post in the chat message your links to your um, XBRF tutorials using MicroPython. They're very cool. I looked at them earlier today. All right, so here we'll flip through some code. I will put the code. Um, select it in new editor so you can see it. And then if you want to maximize or rearrange your windows so you have a better video, um, then you can see the circuits I'm running. So the first one is just a simple push button. Um, I would call it a whiskers, we call them normally. And uh, when this runs in an object, it'll just bounce <laughs> off. So I'm not sure if you got a really good look at that circuit, but yeah, four resistors and then it grounds through the chassis. So set that one running and uh, just give a little look. It, right looks, it looks so much like a robot. It does. And you'll see that we're using the display. So it backs up and then it turns. Okay, so the display is really nice for feedback um, because you can't always have a, a robot wired to a COM port. So let's get a look now at the infrared remote control. Okay, so um, this is just simply an IR receiver connected to an IO pen, and I have an IR remote. So I'll start out by pressing number two, which is forward, and then eight, turn backwards, four, turn left, right, all kinds of things you can do here. That's kind of the skid steer maneuver. I guess I could do a differential drive where it reverses like a uh, bobcat. But yeah, you get an idea of the code here is, is really nice, very simple, easy to read. And um, it's a good example of how we've made reading the infrared receiver quite easy with our module. So let's get a look at light seeking. For that, we're going to turn down the lights and turn on a flashlight. Light seeker, here you are. Okay. Your circuit. A um, couple photoresistors, capacitors, and resistors. Looks like a bug, doesn't it? And this code's using the, the RC time that most of you guys are familiar with. Um, you can see how that's there on the screen. 
and it's just doing the, the same following there, but the, the code, it all operates the same that you're already familiar with from either the bow bot or the shield bot or the activity bot. Now, it's a lot of fun if you take 20 of these and you simply open the classroom door outside so some natural light comes in, they'll all find their way out. And then you can uh, make it a real competition by adding in some other object avoidance so they don't hit each other, but it's really exciting to see how it works in mass. I like getting them all lined up in a dark room, shining a light, and they all come at you like a bunch of zombies. That's a lot of fun, too. Infrared object avoidance. Oh, what do we have? Okay, this is one of the more advanced circuits, um, but if this looks like a lot on a breadboard, I'll let you know that Andy has put every single circuit you've seen here, with the exception of line following, on a single breadboard. So this is really only the beginning of what can be done, but you're looking at uh, two IR emitters and then receivers and then their associated circuitry, some resistors. I'll turn this on. So this is a wireless object avoidance that works up to a foot or so. And um, it has just a happy face, sad face. So we'll set that running. And Tommy, when you build these with teachers, and Chuck, uh, what's your success rate initially? The circuit. That circuit, uh, by that point, we're get, I've, I've rarely had anybody get in a workshop not be successful with this. Even people that are like, well, you don't know me. I've never programmed before. I'm not good at this. It's, by that point, we're, we're rocking and rolling and have a, a grand time. So I've, I've had, I think I could say, probably a, a good solid 95%. Um, I would say 100%, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who goes, no. Nah. <laughs> so this is the opposite, um, same circuit, but we will be tracking an object. So we'll be centering it between the two emitters and receivers. So instead of steering away from it, we'll be steering towards it. Now this can be used to make one robot follow another. You have to put some business cards or some paper around the other robot so it could be seen at this height. Um, but it's a fun to combine, say, with line following or other moving objects. Hey, Ken, you, you said that a business card or a piece of paper, I like to just call them an IR reflector. It makes it sound so much more technical. <laughs> I love your high-tech IR reflector. <laughs> so maybe something a little bigger here. And you have to kind of adjust your circuit a little bit just to you know make it work exactly right. And the tutorials will show you how to tune this too. So I could back this guy right up off of the table. How do you like that one? Is that fun to see? Let us know in the chat. Kind of a nervous little robot, isn't it? Oh, here's another one. Uh, this is kind of fun. What would this one do? It has on the end of it a pin. And it has a ultrasonic sensor. What do you think? Okay, we'll get some Python colored balloons out. And we will just roam towards the balloon and then blow it up. Ah! <laughs> Did you like that one? You want to see it again? Do it again, do it again. Okay, all right. It's easy enough. Here's the other Python color, yellow. This one might be a fail. Oh, maybe not. Okay. This is about when my uh, neighbors show up and say, what's going on over there? Okay, and finally we've got a really crazy line follower. So another example of um, using that library effectively. And we'll switch over to that code. Um, this is not the exact code I'm running. I've made a couple modifications. I'm using the high-speed servos. So I hopped this up yesterday. Um, the circuit's a lot of fun to build, as you can see. It takes about half of an hour. And um, I'm pretty much running full speed. So let's get a line following track. And this is really running at the ragged edge of performance and sensibility. So to make it work reliably is normally what you'd see in our curriculum with slow examples. So we give the student room for improvement. Um, so never mind this. This is just the, the hobby side of me coming out. Uh, 
And so, yeah, I will fall off the line because I'm literally driving right off the line, but didn't have any time to fully tune this example, but I think I could still make it go and stay on the line at full speed. And of course, um, the kind of code you write would go with the curves you have in your line and whether or not there are any gaps in them. How do you like that? That is so fast. <laughs> that's the high speed servos, right? Yeah, and that's not even on um, VN. So that's running at five volts, but they could be connected directly to the battery pack and run at seven and a half. And things shouldn't get uh, too melty at that stage. So you like the demo so far? Pretty neat. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch over to, back to the presentation now. I like over in uh, chat, uh, John Morse said that uh, the if else there could be done using a dictionary. And that's one of the cool things about using Python is that if you're transitioning from the Bobot, you, the, you just follow the, the same logic. But if you're, um, if you're familiar with Python, you can take that same logic, port it over into more powerful data structures, and you can have so, so much more fun, um, you know, the, making the code more legible and uh, introducing those, those lessons just one layer, one step at a time. That's one of the cool things about Python I love. Good idea. As for system compatibility, okay, so we're showing Mu. Mu works on Windows just fine. It works pretty well on the Mac, but we're, we're submitting some requests for some little particular improvements that we're seeing. And there's also an online editor um, that you could use, but you'll need to copy the entire library contents into that and paste it. And that could be used on Chromebooks. There's an app and an online editor. So we have um, all platforms covered here with the exception of uh, iPads. Um, so there's a question from Dennis here. Why should I use this if the next Propeller 2 WX board supports MicroPython? <laughs> well, <laughs> these things take years to get working, Dennis. Um, that's why we, we, we're pretty much uh, at stage one of that project. It'll take probably a couple of years before we have that fully working. That's a good question. Yeah, but no need to hold off buying um, this car because another great one's coming out. <laughs> um, how to get it? And what does it look like? Okay, so it comes in a beautiful box like this. The box can be used to um, store the assembled robot. Dennis, I wish it was a month or two. It's been 13 years. So yeah, coming soon, right? <laughs> this is the box for the Cyberbot. And the two um, near complete formats it's offered in, one is with the micro bit. Uh, it's a $200 kit. And then the second is no micro bit, which is $10 less. Um, so, and what if you have other robots? So you have an Arduino shield bot or you have a Bobot. And these are questions that came up at the conference where we unveiled this robot in San Antonio um, with NYSERC about two months ago. So these are the parts you would add to either of them. And we are aiming to make this very, very affordable if you already have Parallax hardware. Um, so 80 bucks is all you gotta spend to get this and the board and uh, the pieces and the battery pack to retrofit your robot. So hey, I'll even, uh, Ken, I'll even jump in here and say that yeah. I took the, the Cyberbot board um, with, my, uh, with one of my test uh, versions. This is actually at my, um, my Bobot board. I, I took the, the uh, Board of Education off, put on the Cyberbot, and everything else is exactly the same. In fact, I'm even using the old four double A's that's on here. Uh, I recommend doing the five. Uh, it gives you just a little bit more uh, longevity out of it, but it works just the same. Um, so retrofitting it <laughs> is a, a real dream. Now accepting credit cards. Thanks, John Morris. <laughs> so round table Q and A. So we want to um, answer all questions that have not been answered. And you could raise your hand and chat or do whatever you want here. Use the Q&A, comments. Then it says, so to get it right, use uh, the Activity Board 360 to learn C and then Cyberbot, Cyberbot to learn Python. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the challenge he's seeing, um, which is very true, is it's hard to, to get one robot to do everything that we need in education because the tools keep evolving. So it's a continual chase. Well, every classroom is different, too. Mm-hmm. 
Um, as far as John Morrison, a credit card, if you want to give me your credit card, I'll take it. I can't promise you'll get a cyber bot. <laughs> okay, so um, anybody else want to jump in and ask a question live? Uh, Kent Gibbs, the microbit has both radio and uh, Bluetooth. Um, the radio allows board to board communication and uh, the Bluetooth low energy uses, uh, allows Bluetooth communication. They're actually one and the same, uh, as far as I'm aware. And um, we have had one, you know, I, I don't want to, um, you know, any kind of false promises here, but one challenge that we've had is the amount of code that Python uses for the, the radio communication for Bluetooth um, eats up a lot of that memory. So we've had some challenges with Bluetooth and this. That's why we haven't been able to demo that. Uh, we're hitting a few roadblocks there, but um, that's that's possible there. Uh, Jim says, I want to know about wireless programming. You can program a uh, micro bit wirelessly. The, um, I have not tested that with the um, with a micro bit because we've been doing things in Python. You can program them wirelessly with graphical, but not with Python. So there's a, a hang up there. There's another question about programming languages, um, environments. So initially we're supporting MicroPython. However, we do have already working in Microsoft to make code. Some examples, those, those will come later. Is there a way to add off-board memory? Uh, good idea, um, haven't tried it yet. So uh, there may be something available with the I2C. Um, and I think the hope too is that when Microbit comes out with newer versions that have more memory, that we, we already have the hardware and we can just do so much more because I want to use the radio with the robot and have the robots do swarm behavior. So there, there's your answer there. Uh, Andy says he, he tried the uh, adding more memory and it works with I2C. Oh, beautiful. That is sweet. That's cool news. Yeah. Good idea. That's what I like about these kind of groups. You get some cool ideas coming out of this. Yeah, so maybe um, who's using microbits already in school that's uh, joined us? Because three quarter of you already have experience with Parallax products. If you're using the microbit already, maybe just type in a comment and tell us. We also have four questions open in our Q&A pane as well. Oh. Huh. And a hand raise, which I'm looking for. You want to take the hand? and So um, I'll answer, answer Nat Nathalie's question. Mm -hmm. So it'll be available everywhere in the world. Um, we're working with um, Newark and Farnell to make it available through them. But anybody can order directly from Parallax anytime from March onward. And um, yeah, John Kaufman, good to see you. Um, we don't have encoder support. We did not use the Feedback 360 servos. And uh, we're definitely thinking with the audience that we're aiming for a younger one. Um, it's not necessary, but there is a possibility we could support the Feedback 360 servo in the future. The Bobot encoder add-on that you're thinking of oh. uses a different wheel too. It, it doesn't use the encoders that come, um, right. the encoder wheels that are, were designed to use with the Bobot. So it would be a, need those additional wheels. And over the Microbot, I don't know the Microbot, um, but yeah, I can just familiarize you with the Parallax ecosystem, which is a, a strong one, of course. And an evolving one that's continually growing around the products. And as far as she's mentioning the, the make block, so Microbot has blocks that are available in make block. Uh, that's, that's our, that's where we want to go. So uh, right now we're just focusing on Python, but that's where we want to go with it. Go our next, yeah. This, these things have a sequence of development and Python came first. And then a question about workshops. Ah. Jaya. Yeah, the question is, are you planning to organize a full day hands-on workshop for Cyberbot? Um, I think Parallax is at being asked if, like you're doing for the AC uh, bot. Uh, I know NYSERC is gonna support this summer some conversations on Cyberbot at our uh, annual EDF events or cyber EDF events. Uh, you can go to nycerc.org uh, and look for the um, professional development tab and there's going to be some information on the EDF appearing shortly and I'll let uh, Parallax answer anything your guys are working on with the cyberbot. We currently have um, a number of four-hour sessions that occur over two days planned in Chicago uh, which will be noted on our website soon and those are at um, Moline Community College I believe. Um, yeah so we'll note that on our website um, but after that we'll figure we'll make decisions about doing 
full full one day and two day professional developments. I'll also coattail that with uh, if you're at a school and you want a professional development workshop at your school, um, NYSERC will uh, can provide that kind of a workshop uh, experience at your school for free, covered through a grant that we have. Um, the difference between us doing the workshop versus Parallax doing the workshop is if Parallax leads your workshop, you get to keep the stuff. If we do it, well, there are babies we're bringing along, so we want to bring them back with us. Yeah, so. and uh, you know, we've actually given out um, robots. Last year we gave out 500, and this year we're kind of doing the same thing. So we haven't totally determined if we're going to give these out or not. They're, they're cool. You don't want to give them out. Uh, they're also expensive <laughs> to make. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like we've consumed most of those questions, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, Carol still has a hand up. Oh, oh. yeah, um, for those, those, those early adopters of ours who are so, so um, popular on the interwebs, we definitely plan on getting you some boards. <laughs> you know who you are. And well, my question was about uh, I noticed that there's no mention of XPs or anything. Will that be something in the future for the micro bit? We haven't tried XPs yet. Um, I know Rob Faludi is here and he knows a lot, of, lot more about that. Um, he's been doing some of this work, but there is serial communication available from the micro bit and we can access the pins, so I would think so. We just haven't tried it yet, so that might be a job for you, Carol. Yeah, I'd like to talk to Rob. I've got everything working on my XB3 and uh, I'm on the network and everything, and I, but I just can't get a, my phone to answer it. Oh, okay. So, a Rob. A tiny link somewhere is missing. Rob, if you could paste in your tutorials on um, MicroPython, that would be great into the chat. I got those. I got okay, them. perfect. Yeah, so now you know where to find him and you guys can work together. Educator hotline. Um, if you're a teacher and you are stranded or you just need anything at all, you can call us during the day. This rings straight to our iPhones, wherever we are. And one of the three of us um, who are comfortable answering the educator hotline will answer. We talk to students. We talk to you about giving you quotes. We help you find comports, um, whatever you need. We don't want you to be stuck in class. So call us anytime. This line goes off for us as early as 6 a.m. Pacific time. It's no big deal. If one of us is available, we'll answer it. Any chance we're going to be going uh, down in the New Zealand area for educators courses in the future? And if so, can I volunteer for that one? <laughs> <laughs> There's a strong possibility. It's, it's popular <laughs> there. Um, as you recall, we taught most of the electronic constructors years ago. So yeah, we could return. Um, and for that request, um, Nathalie, bring us a teacher or location or a series of locations that can span most of the country and we'll see what we can do. And Stephanie will pack her bags. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> and a question, are the 360 servos um, compatible with a micro bit? I don't think we have tried that particular combination. Perhaps Andy might repeat in the chat pane if he has anything to say on the subject, but I know we're currently focusing on the same continuous rotation servos that are in the bow bot and shield bot so we can have somewhat of a parallel curriculum. Yeah, technical feasibility question. And it, it could be a future upgrade too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Any other uh, yeah, final questions? <laughs> Thank you all for attending today. Um, hope the webinar is what you needed it to be. Um, March 1st, this comes out. The product pages are up, and we'll be posting resources there as they are developed. I want to uh, just address John Kaufman's uh, question about a book. We are going to be flowing book style and length tutorials on our Learn website <clears throat> Excuse me. initially just because everything is um, under development and we're working close with the uh, editor providers and as they make improvements that could change how our instructions will change. This could definitely go to print sometime in the future, but I imagine it would probably be at least a year before if we'd want to commit that to print. Uh, Dennis has a, a, a note over in chat. He says that um, the way he sees it, that start with microbit curriculum and then switch to the robot for survivors. 
Absolutely. That's the way that I envision it. Cause like you, you do so much with the micro bit, but it's still just laying limp on the table. I want to get this thing doing something cool. And that's where you strap it onto this guy and you get your micro bit moving, doing stuff. It's fun. So that's a great progression to do that. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tommy and Chuck and Stephanie and Kate and Andy and Jeff and David and the list goes on and on because so many people have contributed so much to this and it's wonderful to finally see it uh, getting close. We've been working on this for over a year and the idea was originally posed to us from Tommy here. So this is his idea. <laughs> thank you, Tommy. You've kept us very busy for a year. <laughs> Make work. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. We had a, we're having a wonderful time working with it, though, and it's been rewarding for us, and we've all learned a lot. So looking forward to the next steps here. Yep, thank you. <laughs> and um, we'll catch you all at the next event. Thanks, everybody, for your cool. interest. Yep. Thanks, everybody. See you. Bye now.